I'd just like to say before I start uh, three very brief things. First of all, what a great uh, joy it is for me to visit for the first time the Titus Bronzma Institute. Uh, I've been familiar with its work and read so many of the things uh, that are produced here over the course of the years, but it is the first time I had the opportunity to see the Institute in operation. Uh, secondly, it's a great honor for me to be invited here to honor uh, an old friend, uh, Hein Blumstein, uh, whom I've known for many years and whose work has been, I think, influential on all of us who study uh, spirituality. And I know he is retiring, but I'm sure he's not stopping. <laughs> In that sense, uh, I wish him, you know, ad multos anos uh, for his uh, work uh, in the history of spirituality. Uh, thirdly, I suppose it's a bit foolhardy for someone uh, from America with my own <laughs> linguistic limitations to talk about Dutch mysticism. Uh, and I fully recognize that foolhardiness, but I'm going to plunge ahead anyhow. And part of the reason that I want to do so is because the heritage of Dutch mysticism is for universal Christianity in, in that sense. And I think it's not as well known, unfortunately, as it might be you know, in, uh, uh, in other realms, non-Dutch-speaking uh, non realms. And so in my course of writing this endless history of Christian mysticism, I've had to confront uh, Dutch mysticism and spend a good deal of time with it. And I hope that what I'll be able to say will contribute to that dissemination of this extremely uh, valuable and rich tradition in the history of Christian mysticism. And really what I'll say about the evangelical pearl is a short part, a shortened version of something that will appear in the fifth volume of my history, which I hope will be out in a year or two, called The Varieties of Vernacular Mysticism uh, in the Late Middle Ages. So, in 1542, a thick book entitled Die Grote Evangelische Perle was published in Antwerp. In the preface to the volume, the Cologne Carthusian Nicholas von S updated the preface written in the earlier edition, the first edition published in Antwerp in 1537 and 1539. In that first edition, the author was described in very general terms as, quote, a famous enlightened person, noble not only from family, but much more from virtues, whose name is written in the Book of Life. Van Es was able to add more information, telling us that the author was a woman, a virgin who had died on January 27, 1540, in her 77th year. He also informs us that she lived in our parents' house under a spiritual director and had taken a vow of obedience. This makes the anonymous author seem like a kind of begging or house begging, and we know that Van Essen and the Cologne Charter House had contacts with such groups. But in chapter 35 of the third book of the Pearl, the author speaks twice of her religious profession, and she laments at having broken the vow she had taken, and she also confesses to, and I'll quote here, I love this, being recalcitrant like a hedgehog toward my superiors. And these phrases seem to suggest the life of an enclosed nun, a situation that also seems to fit the emphasis on the liturgy of the hours found in the book. Despite this tantalizing information, the identity of the Pearl author has continued to resist the efforts of scholars to come up with a precise identification. What is clear is that the Pearl is the foremost product of what has been called a mystical renaissance, a mystical renaissance that flourished in the convents and beguinages of the borderlands of Netherlands and Germany in the first half of the 16th century. Beside the writings of Maria van Hoek and the works of the Pearl author, the witnesses to this renaissance include a still unedited collection of 162, 162 mystical sermons on the liturgical year that appear to come from the convent of St. Agnes in Arnhem. Very few today outside the Low Countries have read or even heard of the great evangelical pearl. There is evidence, however, that the cloud of unknowing that has hidden the pearl for two centuries or more has begun to gradually lift a reprint of the French translation of 1602 was published in 1997, along with a lengthy introduction and a very helpful apparatus. And at the end of last year, an English translation of the third book of the Pearl was published in a collection called Late Medieval Mysticism in the Low Countries. 
These are signs of a new diffusion of the work, and I think they are significant because for me the Evangelical Pearl is arguably the last great masterpiece of medieval female mysticism. Neglect of the Evangelical Pearl is a modern phenomenon. In the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, the Pearl was widely read, appearing in at least 19 or perhaps 20 different uh, editions, not only in its two Dutch forms, but also in translations into Latin, French, and German. And there's a handout that will clarify some of that, and whether it's uh, enough of them to go around. But uh, the diffusion was remarkable. And many of the great figures of the golden age of French mysticism, such as Barbacari, Pierre de Bellou, Bennett Canfield, and Francis de Sales, were familiar with the pearl in the French version that had been prepared by the Paris Carthusians. Writing to a friend of Jean de Chantal, Francis de Sales advised her about good spiritual reading as follows, and I quote him here. You can usefully read the books of Mother Teresa and St. Catherine of Siena. Also read The Method of Serving God, The Summary of Christian Perfection, and The Evangelical Pearl. You should not be eager to practice all the beautiful things you see there, but to long for and admire these beautiful teachings with full gentleness. The Latin translation, prepared by Van Es and possibly also Laurentius Surius, was first published in Cologne in 1545 and reprinted in 1609 and 1610. This gave the pearl a European-wide diffusion. Indeed, it was the Latin form, rather different from the Dutch in a number of ways, which was the basis for the French and the two later German versions, the first of which was prepared by the mystical poet Angelus Silesius and published in Glatz in 1676. Silesius waxes poetic about the book in his preface. He says, <clears throat> Yes, I dare to say that this is the one precious pearl among all spiritual books, for whose sake one should sell all the other books and buy this one alone. Sounds like the publisher's blurb. Buy this one alone. A person who puts into practice only the exercises written down here will need no other books, not even this one. <laughs> there were other channels of transmission. Excerpts from the Pearl were included in the Pseudonymous Institutionis Tauleri Anne, published by Peter Canisius in 1548 as an appendix to his Latin rendering of Tower. This popular work was soon translated into uh, Spanish, Italian, and French. The French Protestant spiritual writer Pierre Poré, who edited the works of Madame Guillon, was much taken with the Pearl, and used it extensively in his Théologie Royale, published in 1700. Through his influence, the pietist mystic Gerhard Tierstegen became acquainted with the book and in 1767 published a German anthology drawn from it under the title The Perlenschnur. So the Evangelical Pearl may not have been exactly a bestseller, but it had a considerable diffusion and a wide readership. The exact form of the Evangelical Pearl is almost as much of a mystery as its author because the Pearl exists in four different versions and there seem to be variations even within copies of these. There is a single manuscript in The Hague that contains numerous excerpts from the text, again anonymous. The arrangement of this form, uh, these are Albert Ampe's identifications, PM, uh, this form appears closer to the Latin than to the Dutch version. The first printed version was the short or small pearl, small p for Ampe, one book of 39 chapters published in 1535 in Utrecht. The Great Pearl, capital P, first published in 1537 and 1539 and reprinted with some new material in 1542, comprised three books with 169 chapters. The Latin version, 1545 Latin version, capital PL, is more than just the translation of the Dutch, but it rearranges the order of the books, adding material, dividing the chapters differently, so that the total number of chapters in the Latin and the French is 186. On the basis of his long engagement with the Pearl, Albert Ampa argued that both the Dutch and the Latin are harmonizations of a lost original text and that all the surviving forms seem to have authentic passages that are proper to each. 
this messy situation explains why, although Father Ampa was able to publish a critical edition of the other major mystical text of the anonymous author, that's the treatise Van den Tempel on Sezelen, uh, he was not able to complete the critical edition of the pearl that he had promised. Despite some work that has been done on comparing the versions, uh, preparing an edition of Dutch pearl faces many difficulties. Not only the large number of variations, but also this is a long book. Uh, the French reprint is 500 pages, and the Dutch electronic form, which I've been able to use and was kindly sent to me, is 14,886 lines. So in light of these textual problems, in the following presentation, while I'll try to summarize the mysticism of the pearl, I'm going to make use of the Dutch and the Latin and the French. Uh, my footnotes will make that clear. But in citing books and chapters, I'll generally make use of the order of the Latin and the French because their order seems preferential to that of the Dutch, and also in part because the only full form of the pearl that is currently available to readership is the reprinted French version, published again in 1997 by Jérôme Milon de Grenoble. So, uh, something about the structure of the pearl briefly, and then my major concentration will be on the teaching of the pearl. The evangelical pearl is compendious and often confusing with themes emerging and re-emerging over the course of its three authentic books. The Latin pearl, by the way, adds a fourth book of 18 chapters. This appears to have been put together by the translator in an attempt to show the harmony between the teaching of the pearl and recognized mystical authorities, particularly Suso, Towler, and Rusbrook. I describe the pearl as a kind of reservoir into which run the rivers of many traditions of late medieval mysticism, especially Rusbrook's Trinitarian mysticism, but also aspects of a mysticism of the ground based on Eckhart, currents of an erotic mysticism using the Song of Songs, forms of identification with Christ through imitatio passionis, and a wide variety of mystical exercises based on sacramental and liturgical practice. Now, this sounds like a, a melange, and to a certain extent it is. But what prevents the pearl from being just a kind of textbook or a, you know, an omnium gatherum of everything is the theological penetration and originality of the author's mystical message. The 186 chapters that constitute the uh, Latin and French pearl do not follow any discernible order. Although the author makes use of Bruce Brooks' threefold division of the journey to God into the stages of first the active life, secondly the interior life, and third the spiritual or superessential life, this division does not correspond to the three books of the pearl in any of the known forms. In the anonymous author's preface, she says that her purpose is to write in simple words the essential truths and practices to lead humble people to, and again I quote, a stable, loving union with God who is our origin. A stable, loving union. This is why the book is called The Evangelical Pearl, she goes on. Now I'm going to uh, skip a few pages here which are attempt to summarize the, uh, the, the three uh, books because, of course, any brief summary of what's uh, the content of these three books doesn't begin to reveal why I think the book can be described as a, a mystical classic. To investigate this claim to its classic status, I want to look at three aspects of the teaching of the Pearl. First, its theology proper, that is, its doctrine of God. Secondly, its anthropology. And thirdly, what we can describe as its mystagogy, its uh, account of the path to union. And obviously, I'll concentrate greatly on that third uh, issue. The Pearl author was a learned woman. Although the text only cites authorities by name 30 times, it is obvious that the author was widely read, though mostly silent about her sources. I mean, Rusbrook is a major source, but she only cites Rusbrook by name once. She cites Eckhart by name once. Ten times she explicitly uses the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard said this. Seven times she says Augustine, etc. Uh, so uh, there are a wide variety of named sources, 
but a much wider uh, uh, list of unnamed sources and Father Ampa's edition of Funding Temple on Sailing shows just how widely read the author was. Although she was widely read, the author was not an academic theologian. She was what I like to call a vernacular theologian of the late medieval period. And hence she has little explicit treatment of the divine nature taken in itself. She often speaks of the three persons of the Trinity, but almost always in relationship to the way in which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are imaged in the soul, the soul's three higher powers of memory, understanding, and will. Sometimes she does use speculative language about God, the speculative language characteristic of uh, late medieval Germanic uh, mysticism. For example, she refers to God as an abyssal essence, or an essential unity, or abyssal love. And again, I have the vocabulary here, both in the Latin and in the uh, Dutch. And she often uses the term ground or grunt, as well as the term afgrunt, the abyss. And if you've read Rusbrook or Meister Eckhart or Towler, etc., will recognize the, <clears throat> the vocabulary of the late uh, medieval mysticism of Germanic countries. Picking up on a theme that goes back to Augustine, it was also used by Rusbrook and other Dutch mystics, she describes God as a paradox who is always active and always at rest, semper agens et semper quietus, as Augustine says in chapter 4, book 1 of the Confessions. But interestingly enough, when she uses this term that God is always active and at rest, she expresses this within the context of God inviting the soul to share in this mode of life, this coincidence of opposites. I quote a passage here. God addresses the author uh, in, um, I forget what the chapter is here, but he says, you should join enjoyment and activity just as I am always working and still immovably at rest. So the Pearl author is mainly interested in how the reader reaches the living presence of God in daily life, not in academic speculation on the nature, on the divine nature taken in itself. Secondly, anthropology. In order to understand how we are to attain the inner presence of God, the author does need to discuss anthropology in greater detail. And a number of chapters are explicitly devoted to analyses of the powers of the soul and the relation of the soul to the body. Many other chapters advert to anthropological issues in passing. Anthropology, of course, cannot be separated from Trinity and Christology, as the Pearl author shows in a teaching that, it, that the book shares with earlier German and Dutch mystics. This is one of the major themes of late medieval mysticism, the emphasis on the soul as the true kingdom of God, the kingdom of God proclaimed in the Gospels. For example, uh, Book 2, Chapter 41, that's Book 3 in the Dutch, 41, bears the title, On the Prophet of Seeking the Kingdom of God Before All Else. And it speaks of how the whole day, from first rising, till going to bed should be devoted to offering our prayers to God in order to find, quote, the secret way which leads the soul into the hidden abyss of God and into the hidden riches of his divine truth. This inward way seeks to remove all images so that the soul can gaze into the imageless bareness of the divine nature and simple divine truth where the soul's countenance is illuminated by the countenance of God and the three powers, memory, understanding, and will, are united with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This cannot happen, however, other than by the merits of Jesus Christ as clearly shown in the Old and New Testaments. And this is why Christ announced, the kingdom of God is within you, the treasure lies hidden in the field. That's the famous text from Luke 17, uh, 21. After that Trinitarian and Christological dimension, the uh, pearl continues with this uh, passage. Uh, she says, If this treasure and that kingdom of God are to be found in your soul, it must happen through Jesus Christ, who is the door to it, the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Through which we must enter into the kingdom of God and into the union of the Godhead. So, coming within into the kingdom of God necessarily involves union with the Trinity 
and the way in through Christ. The details of the author's doctrine of human nature, as composed of spirit, soul, and body, the Pauline tripartite tri uh, anthropology, are largely dependent on Rusbrook. Like the canon of Grolandal, the Pearl author conceives of human nature as existing on two levels. There's the higher level. The higher level is that of being or essence, where the soul is one with its pre-existent or virtual existence in God, as the author puts it in uh, Book 2, Chapter 8. The soul always has God within her, and she is always in God. She takes her rest in her principle in the divine source with that simple essence from which God never departs, nor does the simple essence depart from God. The faculties of the soul may be obliged to turn outward and to be busy with a multiplicity of things, but her essence abides in God. So this level you know, corresponds to the hidden divine ground or abyss, and the pearl also describes it in language reminiscent of Rusbrook as essential unity of spirit, essential unity of spirit. In one place she says that the ladder that by which we ascend to God, and I, I quote here again, reaches up to and proceeds into the abyss of the Godhead, into the essential unity of spirit, where the spirit is angelic and divine, and dwells more in heaven than on earth, for its place is in God, and its work is in God, and it is God by grace. On one side of itself, in its deepest ground, it is not itself. So that's the higher level. So there's a second or lower level of concrete actual existence, and here humanity follows the Pauline tripartite structure, spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The higher powers that constitute the spirit are identified as the Augustinian triad of memory, intellect, and will. And these powers are united in the soul's essence but insofar as they become active, they come to form the image of the three persons of the Trinity. The lower powers that make up the soul, the principle of ordinary life, are also threefold. They consist of the desiring power based uh, on memory, giving rise to the affections of hope, love, and joy. Secondly, the power of reason that flows from the intellect and expresses itself in conscience and shame. And thirdly, the rejecting power coming from the will, the source of the affections of fear, hate, and sadness. Finally, the, lower, the lowest aspect of our nature is the body. But the body is meant to cooperate with the higher levels in directing the whole person back to God. And the author illustrates this threefold anthropology in one fine chapter by explaining how the ideal of mystical contact with God, who is the Blessed Virgin Mary, in our threefold birth of Jesus, bearing Jesus in spirit, soul, and body, becomes a model for all mystical progress. So the Pearl author's anthropology testifies to the powerful in, uh, influence of Rusbrook on late medieval mysticism in the Low Countries, although it does have, I think, some aspects uh, of originality. So I turn to the main uh, intent of the Pearl, which is its picture of the path to God. The mystagogy that the author describes in her preface as the divine wisdom, which to many perhaps seems foolishness. The Pearl's teaching is primarily practical, although it is always colored by deep theological insight. As its admirers, like Francis de Sales and Silesius, saw, it's a kind of how to do it book. One of the things that these authors and readers, rec these readers recognize as essential to the teaching of the Pearl is its pervasive Christocentrism. There is no access to God save through the God-man. Picking up on a theme from Bernard of Clairvaux, the Pearl teaches that the proper mystical path moves from the humanity of Christ up to the sublimity of Christ's divine nature, but that we must never neglect either nature of the God-man. Felicitous way of expressing this is found in Book 1, uh, chapters 38-39. Here the author speaks of the image of the crucified Jesus as the mirror, the mirror into which we must continually gaze, just as, quote, all the blessed, both humans and spirits, with insatiable desire contemplate that divine mirror where they see God and know God both in his human and in his divine nature face to face. 
Here she says, we contemplate and consider ourselves as if placed between two mirrors, the divinity and the humanity, and we see our own faults. Christ's passion pervades the pearl. An interesting presentation of the book's version of the imitation of the passion is found in the author's refashioning of Bruce Brooks' threefold path to God, and she refashions this in terms of three meditative ascents of Christ as he is hanging on the cross. This is book two, chapters 13 through 20. It's a kind of mini treatise. The Pearl introduces this treatise with a typical late medieval mystical trope, the need for the soul to bathe itself in the blood flowing from Christ's wounds in order to ascend the mountain of the Godhead. Christ Jesus is the first ladder by which we approach the mountain of the Godhead in chapter 14. He is the threefold stairs which we should climb in three rungs, namely the act of the spiritual and the divine life. So there's an extended meditation which proceeds by considering Christ's whole body, his feet, his knees, his bodily uh, corpus, his head, his heart, his senses, proposing a kind of prayer exercise for attaining virtues at each stage. You can see the, the exercise, uh, the spiritual exercise part of this. This constitutes the active life of the lower sensual person who considers Christ's physical sufferings. The climb to the entrance of the mountain is the ascent to the spiritual life when we consider Christ's inner suffering, specifically the height, depth, breadth, and length of the love that moved him to sacrifice himself for our salvation. And in this chapter, the author emphasizes Christ's interior desolation, a theme found in a number of late medieval mystics. After a chapter dealing with the hindrances in the ascent process, chapters 17 through 20 of this brief treatise describe the third ladder, or the third stage, which is the joyful spirit of Christ, by which even while suffering on the cross, he remained fixed on God in the essential unity of his higher powers. Again, the Rusbrookian phrase, the essential unity. Our sharing in Christ's spirit brings us to the superessential abyss, where we look into the secret deep abyss in the innermost recesses of the spirit and become, by grace, what Christ is by nature. Chapter 19 summarizes this journey upwards through the crucified Christ in terms of one of the more challenging motifs of late medieval mysticism, the merging of the abyss of the soul and the abyss of God. Here invoking a Cartian language of breaking through into God. Durchbrech or Durbrechen. Let me cite a longer passage here. It is here that one must lay down his very self before the divine abyss and give himself up with simplicity of spirit, with its faculties subjugated, with simplicity of heart. This must occur without any understanding, image, or likeness. For if one enters to the image of Christ into the abyss of the soul, there must hereafter be no other image than a simple one-foldedness, for God in himself is one-fold. Faced with this abyss, one must lay down his very self and sink into his nothingness. How noble is this breakthrough, that a person can thus break through to the very abyss of truth, and that God would see fit to do his work in him, embracing soul and body. This is nobler than his flowing out. That is the fact that he flows out from God to whom we must all come. Uh, this passage provides not only an insight in some of the profound aspects of the mysticism of the pearl, but it reveals clear affinities with Meister Eckhart's famous sermon 52, the uh, poverty sermon. There are quotations actually within the passage I just read. <clears throat> Now, the mystical path set forth in the pearl is one of introversion into the ground of the soul, as well as a number of concrete external practices involving the daily exercises of the religious life. Much of the text, in fact, is concerned with the proper mental attitudes for finding the inner meaning of the liturgical hours of the day, daily prayers like the Our Father and Hail Mary, and the rituals of daily life, rising, taking meals, going to bed. It's important to keep the liturgical and sacramental nature of the pearl in mind when we investigate briefly what the book has to say about some of the fundamental themes of late medieval mysticism, like detachment, annihilation, birthing of the word in the soul, and union. Like many of the mystical texts in the 13th through the 15th centuries, 
The evangelical pearl holds that introversion, and the stripping away of all desires and images, are necessary in order to attain the inner annihilation in which the nothingness of the created soul becomes one with the transcendent nothingness, or no-thingness of God. Since at least the time of St. Augustine, the road to finding God has been seen as a process of introversion into the depths of the soul. And this message was central to the pearl. Equally important was the need for divesting the self of all attachments, desires, images of created things. And the pearl uh, uses the term, uh, a Cartesian term, detachment for this stripping away process. One quotation from Book 2, Chapter 21. There the spirit is led up into detachment, and the best part is fulfilled and secured. It is separated from inferior things and is cut off from its own body and soul. At times, this stripping action becomes a substantive Galatenheit, similar to the Galassenheit of medieval German mysticism. The strongest form of detachment, letting go of self, dying to self, involves annihilation, annihilation and merging with God. Dangerous doctrines, of course, since the execution of Marguerite Poret and the condemnation of Eckhart. What can it mean to say that the created self is annihilated so that only the divine self remains? Theologians and inquisitors had very legitimate suspicions about such claims, and mystics responded by making distinctions, especially distinctions relating to different levels of the self. The Pearl author uses annihilation language in many places. And the book's powerful negative message about the fusion of the divine nothingness with the human nothingness is especially evident in Book 1, chapters 40 through 47. Let me comment briefly on these. This is, a, again, another kind of mini treatise. And it starts out by proclaiming three practices that are necessary for attaining God. The first is letting go, Latin or abnegatio. The second is suffering, Latin or tolerancia in the Latin, bearing suffering. The third is the exercise of nothingness. The first two practices, letting go of our own wishes and accepting suffering for the sake of Christ's passion, are unobjectionable. But the exercise of attaining nothing echoes some of the more daring passages in Eckhart. Attaining nothingness, we are told, is just like someone who possesses nothing, can do nothing, knows nothing, has power in nothing. In this nothing is all our salvation. The author says we need to go back, quote, into that nothing in which we were when we had not yet been created, so that God can as freely act in us on behalf of his will as he was able to act when we were still uncreated in him. If you know Eckhart, again, these are almost direct citations from Sermon 52. This return to the pre-created self involves the transformation of our will into God's will, as well as attaining true resignation, true essential poverty. And the Anonymous expands on this with a long paragraph on what I like to call the double nothing. That is the fusion of the unnameable nothing that is God with the nothing that is the soul. I quote again, laying aside every interior activity, let us cast ourselves into the center uh, it's uh, put in the Dutch, punctum in the Latin, into the center of the divine essence, so that we may never return thenceforth. There and then, essence is grasped by essence. Then the nothing that is God is found in the nothing that is the soul. There the nothing that is the soul is wrapped within the nothing that is God. There, finally, nothing is swallowed up by nothing. True to the practical nature of the text, chapter 41, that's chapter 40, continues by providing 10 practices for advancing towards this nothingness. And chapter 42 returns to further explanation of the detachment, the suffering, and nothingness, joining annihilation to a major theme of Bruce Brooks mysticism, that is the notion of perfect or abyssal love. We are told this abyssal nothingness receives itself wholly in a form of abyss, and in this abyss that is God, it loses itself and is consumed in God. 
Such a person is totally transformed into God as if she were made into another person. And truly, she is made another person, for the Holy Spirit lives in her in a super-essential way, just as the Spirit did in the Apostles. The love that is expressed in detachment and suffering reaches its culmination in, uh, in annihilation. If a person attains the highest degree of love, the union of will, she says, God comes down and descends into such a detached and resigned person in an abyssal manner. And there he is embraced by the loving soul that is so close to God and by whom the soul is totally absorbed. Totally absorbed. This sounds like a kind of indistinct union that the heretics of the free spirit were accused of. But the Pearl author was obviously aware of the dangers because she closes this chapter with an important qualification. She says, And this way the soul totally loses herself in God and is transformed into God by grace. But nonetheless, she always retains her creaturely existence and thus returns into the principle and origins from which she flowed out. So like other late medieval mystics, the author makes distinctions between levels of being and levels of union here, a kind of escape mechanism to avoid suspicion of heresy. On one level, the soul is indistinct, becomes God. On another level, she always retains her creaturely existence. Now, this treatise on annihilation that I just commented on in similar chapters show the author's familiarity with very important themes of the mysticism of late medieval Germany and the related teaching of Wurzburg on themes such as poverty of spirit, um, freedom of spirit, and other kinds of language. Uh, also, a third form of language intimately connected with the introverted mysticism of the late Middle Ages is the language of the birth of the divine word in the soul. And here, too, the birth of the word in the soul is not as important in the Pearl author as it had been for Meister Eckhart, but the motif appears in all three books of the work, especially in book two. But before concluding, I'd like to say a little bit about the notion of union in the pearl. Remember, the preface says that the book was composed to lead a person to stable, loving union with God. How does a pearl author understand uniting with God, especially in light of the debates over union in the late Middle Ages? Early on in the pearl, the beginning of book one, chapters five to six, the pearl discusses three forms of union taken from Wurzburg. Union in the super-essential life, union in the illuminative life, union in the active life. The highest union is where the soul is super-essential and deified. The first and supreme life and union, we are told, is a certain perpetual and simple introversion through which the simple essence of the soul is continually plunged into and inclined towards divine union. Second stage is illuminative union, where the persons of the Trinity become one with the three higher powers of memory, intellect, and will. Thirdly, in active union, the lower powers of the soul, she says, have a continual desire and movement to follow the naked, crucified Jesus in all his patience, humility, obedience, detachment, and other virtues. Now, this Brisbrookian view of union often reoccurs, especially in its Trinitarian form, but there are many other modes of speaking about union with God found in the Pearl. I think the model taken from Roosburg, because of its distinction of different levels and modes, helps the Pearl author feel comfortable with making uh, use of a diverse number of ways of talking about union throughout the book. It talks about spousal union, uh, talks about super essential union and at times approaches language for the union of identity or uh, uh, unification, perfect unification with God. Let me quote just one passage here from Book 3. She says, Who then can discern this godlike, lofty, supernatural union where the spirit is taken up in and enclosed in the abyss of its principle? Were it possible to see the spirit in this union, one would scarcely doubt that it is God. By the way, that's an exact quotation from Talbot. Uh, Tower's 56th uh, sermon. So the Pearl author does not use the language of indistinction, aiming Sondo on the skeet, but some of what she says about supersensual union comes very close to this. But once again, I think she carefully distinguishes different levels of union so that, like 
Satsuso, Taller, and Rusbrook, she uh, is not really subject to some of the condemnations that had uh, been uh, issued. Now, there are many other themes that might be uh, spoken about, such as deification and uh, contemplation, which are also very important. But I want to mention one final one, which is uh, brings the author, again, very close to Rusbrook. Namely, the emphasis, the insistence that fruited union must always coexist with loving activity. Although the Pearl does not expound the necessary concomitants of action and contemplation in as much detail as Rusbrook does, her teaching agrees with the Grolandal mystic and his notion of the common life, although it's curious that she never uses that expression. Uh, this aspect of her teaching is evident in many chapters, particularly chapter 45 of book 2, which is under the heading, How the Devout Soul Should Always Dwell in the Cross and Passion of Her Bridegroom. Here she says, the devout soul who makes all three ascents to Christ must combine active love and essential love. In active love, she says, the soul seeks her beloved everywhere and runs through every place where her, be her beloved has suffered, and she makes herself happy by compassion in the places where he suffered. In active love, she uses images of her exercises. But essential love is higher. In essential love, she says, the soul possesses her beloved in all things and changes all multiplicity to simple rest. Finally, we can ask, but who are these perfected contemplatives who have realized this fusion of action and contemplation? Action in contemplation, contemplation in action. Again, the pearl taps into a vocabulary common to many Germanic mystics of the late Middle Ages when she speaks of such people as friends of God. The friends of God are those who attain all three levels of union. They are the people who have balanced the inner and the outer dimensions of the mystical life. To conclude, the author of The Pearl was a contemporary of a better-known late medieval figure, almost an exact contemporary, Martin Luther. Like Luther, she was raised in the world of late medieval piety and mystical teaching. She shared Luther's enthusiasm for Tauler, but not his dismissal of other forms of medieval mysticism. Her world, however, seems little touched by the new religious currents swirling about her. There's only one brief negative reference to Luther in the book. Nevertheless, the evangelical pearl, in its capacity as a summary of medieval German and Dutch mysticism, solidly rooted in traditional liturgical and sacramental practice, achieved fame as a tool of the Catholic reformers in Germany and France who set about providing an alternative to Luther's reaction against the late medieval church. The book was able to speak to a wide audience because, although seemingly written for religious women, it is not limited to any particular class or group. Rather, as the Pearl author insists in one place, and I quote, this ground, this ground is useful and necessary for all, no matter what their state or rank may be. I think the universalism of the great evangelical Pearl helps explain why this classic work was widely read by clergy, religious, laity, including Protestants, between about 1550 and 1800, and may it be read again in our new millennium. Thank you.